Amen. Amen. All right, let's get right into the word today. You can go ahead and be seated. I've got a, I've got a lot of scripture today because if you read the Bible. Welcome to Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost. Welcome everybody joining us online today. Somebody online just said, man, I'm glad I stayed home because I heard Pentecost was the day they get those snakes out. No, the devil is a lie. We ain't getting no snakes out up in this church. That's maybe in some backwoods Pentecostal church, but not in here. You bring a snake out, I'm killing snakes. It's under my feet. The devil's under my feet. Don't tell me, oh, that's a good snake. It kills. It ain't no good snake. Uh-uh, we killing them all in Jesus' name. Pentecost is Pentecosti. It is, it is 10 to the fifth power, which literally just means 50. Pentecost is 49 plus one day after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus spends 40 of those days on the earth. 40 is the number of preparation in his glorified body, his resurrected body. 40 days wandering the earth. Preparing the earth for the greatest dispensation of power that the world has ever seen. He said, for it is good for me to go and I will send another who is just like me. He is your parakletos, your comforter, the Holy Spirit, who will be with you and shall dwell in you. Two separate things. And on Pentecost 2,000 something years ago, there were 10 days that 120 people spent praying in an upper room. Ten days. Now, over those 40 days, Jesus personally appeared to some 500 people. Your Bible says this. Out of that 500 and something people, Eddie, only 120 make it to an upper room. It tells me there is a great demonic pushback on getting people to upper room experiences. The enemy doesn't want you to have an upper room experience. And the fight was to keep them from going to the cross to the upper room. Some of you have gotten to the cross, but you've been afraid to go to the upper room. Ten days, 120 people praying. An outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the birthing of the local church. The promise of Jesus fulfilled. That's what Pentecost is. Fifty, the promise of Jesus fulfilled. The birth of the local church, as we know it, and the restoration of heaven's language, speaking in tongues, praying in tongues. These things happen, these things happen on Pentecost Sunday, and today we celebrate that. Now, throughout your Bible today, I'm going to give you an apologetic stance on the language of the kingdom. Speaking in tongues, praying in the Holy Ghost, what Pentecost Sunday is. So that you not just know what it is, but so that you understand it. So you can apologetically defend your faith and have scripture that backs it. So I'm going to have a lot of scripture for you. Let's, let's begin in this place. In your Bible, in the Old Testament, God created three main feasts. Three main feasts. Stay with me just a little longer and I'll pray us out. These three main feasts were eternal rhythms of worship that belonged to God. God said, when you worship me, I want you to worship me. Watch, according to these feasts. It was the Feast of the Tabernacle, which was the feast that celebrated the atonement of God the Father. How many of you are good with Abba Father, God the Father? You're good with it. Most people can get with this feast here. Then you have the Feast of Passover, which is the Feast of the Blood. This is where we, we, we worship the Son Jesus. This is redemption. So God the Father was atonement. The Passover was redemption. But then there was the feast of Pentecost. And this is typically where you get the pushback. People are like, yeah, I'm good with God the Father, I'm good with Jesus the Son, and I'm good with the Holy Ghost as long as the Holy Ghost don't make me do something that makes me uncomfortable. And this feast was permanent provision from heaven by way of the Holy Spirit. John 20. This is during that 40-day period after the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus said to them again, peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, what did he do? Come on, say it loud. Say it all the way in the back. He breathed on them. 
Why did he breathe on them? Because he only did what daddy did. The father breathed Holy Spirit into Adam and Eve. And the last Adam, the last Adam had to come and restore that. So Jesus, the last Adam, breathed back on humanity and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now these same people are present in our next text. John 20, let's go to Acts chapter 1. Acts 1. They just received the Holy Ghost. But now Jesus says, I want you to wait, verse 4. For the what? For the what? Promise. Somebody say, it's a promise. Somebody say, it's my promise. Of the Father which you said you heard from me. For John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. John says that I baptize you with water, but there is one that is coming after me whose sandals I am not worthy to, to carry, to strap, and he will baptize you with what? Fire. Fire. Acts chapter 2, our main narrative for today. Keep all this in mind. Now when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were in one accord. Not, not in disunity. Not grumbling, not gossiping, not a division against one another, but they were in one accord. What brought them in one accord? Prayer. They were praying in one accord. Take one accord, reach up, touch it, grab it like this, put it right in your pocket. Somebody say one accord because we're going to pull that back out here in a little bit as we walk through this. Do not forget that. They were in one accord in one place. I love these next two words. And... Suddenly, whoo, suddenly a sound from heaven. Can I tell you that God's about to do a suddenly in somebody's life? See, a day here is like a thousand up there, so you think you've been waiting for a long time. But when God gets ready to do a thing, can't no man, Mauricio, stand in the way of it. Can't nobody stop it. Can't nobody do what Jesus can do. So he will suddenly save your child. Suddenly put your marriage back together. Suddenly cause the resources to be there for your business. God's about to do a suddenly for those that would release themselves in prayer to him. Suddenly. I just declare suddenly this building completely paid off so we can build another one so we don't have to have three on Sunday, but we can have one. <laughs> suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house they were sitting, and there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And it sat upon each of them, and they were all, they were all there filled with the Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. As the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, let me just debunk a few myths here and then I'll pray and, and you can go out for about five minutes and come back with sweet Jesus music. In verse 8 in Acts chapter 2, many people will say in this moment, oh, well, they, they spoke uh, Aramaic. They didn't j jibber jabber. Or they spoke, how many of you have heard that before? In this Acts, they spoke the language, the language of, of Greek, or they spoke Hebrew, or they spoke that language. You've heard that. For people trying to say that speaking in tongues is not a heavenly language, that it is literally your God, Jesus, or the Holy Spirit empowering you to speak a foreign language in order to witness. Wrong. Yes, that can happen, but wrong. The Bible does not say that in Acts chapter 2. The Bible very explicitly says that they heard, they heard. Gift of interpretation. They heard the language as if it was their own language. How do we know? Because verse 13 says that there were some people that heard languages, but other people that heard gibberish and said, you're drunk. So those that were in one accord could hear the interpretation. Those that were against it heard drunkenness. That's why there's many people in the church today that say, oh, that stuff is foolish because you're not in one accord with the Spirit of God. You get in one accord with the Spirit and God will take the foolish things of the world ha, to confound the wise. That's why no eye is seen or ear is heard what God has to do for the church, for those that love Him and call according to His purpose. God's about to do something that seems foolish. I almost quoted that scripture right. I halfway butchered it. All right. Now, Acts 19, Paul asked a group of believers, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, whoa, 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 wait a second. 
did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said, no. Paul laid, placed hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came on them. And what happened? They spoke in tongues. All right, let's talk about the language of the kingdom. Lord, remove any hindrance, any religious spirit. Total freedom today. Just total freedom to receive your word. Teach us your ways that we may know you and find your favor. Speak through me only what you want spoken. Touch those that are online. Touch those in this room today. We give you the glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I want to do this in question form today. And the first question that I want to answer is, is speaking in tongues biblical? Is it biblical? Yes, speaking in tongues is scriptural. 1 Corinthians 14, 14, Paul says this, that if I pray in tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. This is the same chapter that people use to say that tongues should cease, that you should earnestly desire to prophesy, which you should, for the edification of the saints. And things should be done decently and in order. But here in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul is talking to a church that was super spiritual and super carnal at the same time. They wanted to prophesy and talk in tongues, but they didn't want to love somebody. They wanted to speak in tongues, but then be sexually immoral. They wanted to be out of order in church, and everybody was a prophesying and a prophet lying. And there were parking lot prophets and foyer prophets, and there were bathroom prophets, and there were green room prophets, and there were prophets running around, running their mouth. And Paul comes in as a spiritual apostolic father to bring order to what was happening at the church in Corinth. So Paul says that, what should I do? He said, I will pray in spirit, and I will pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will sing with my understanding. He said, there are moments that I am going to pray in the spirit and worship in the spirit. But there are other moments that I need my understanding. Why do you need both? You need to pray in English or Spanish or Creole or, or, or Portuguese, whatever your lang language is, so that you can put your stake in the ground and identify when God does what he said he would do. When I pray in English and I understand it when God comes through, guess what I can do? I can testify. So I pray in the spirit, and I also pray in my regular tongue. Now, Mark 16, 17, Jesus says this, red letters. These signs will follow, will, those who believe. In my name, they will cast out devils, demons. They will do what? They will speak with new tongues. Now, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, came to change culture. If you're going to change culture, you got to change what folks are hungry for. You got to change the appetite of the land. In order to change how they act, you have to change how they think. And the way to really tell if a kingdom has colonized a territory is when that territory begins to speak the language of the kingdom in which took over for them. See, when you really know you've been fully submersed in the Holy Spirit, it changes your language. You don't no longer speak your natural language, but you also pray according to the Spirit. So God didn't send the Spirit to entertain us. God sent the Spirit to change us. Everything in us, including the language that we speak. You say, Pastor, am I supposed to walk around and speak in tongues all the time? No. You would sound stupid. But to change all of us. This is why we don't need cute sermons in church and just come to church and sit in a pew or in a chair and leave the same way we came in. We are not called to be entertained. We are called to be changed. So we are a spirit-filled church, which does not mean shouting. It does not mean charismatic expression. It means that we are a church that is devoted to the change and conviction of the Holy Ghost. Now let's move forward. If you can't tell, I like preaching on this. Number two, is the baptism of the Holy Spirit a separate work from salvation? It's funny, I got a whole lot of yeses on the first question. Is speaking in tongues scriptural? Yeah. Is it a separate work from salvation? Let's, let's read the Bible. 
there are three baptisms I want to explain to you in your Bible. Your Bible. So don't get mad at me. Don't blame Pentecostal churches. Get mad at God. Three baptisms explained. Being baptized by the Holy Spirit, possessive, by the Holy Spirit, is to be completely submerged in the blood of Christ unto salvation. Being baptized by a disciple is being completely submerged in water into the purity of your new life. Okay, complete submerged. Being baptized by Jesus in the Holy Spirit is to be completely submerged in the power of the Holy Spirit into a supernatural life. Now, there are three distinctly different baptisms mentioned theologically and grammatically in Scripture, making it impossible for you to deny, impossible for you to refute. It is grammatically, but it is also theologically. In all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, the Synoptics, and even John that was written in 70 A.D., years after the last Gospel was written, John comes in, and while John adds in the woman at the well, and John adds in Nicodemus, and John adds in different things about love that the other, the other Gospel writers did not write, they went straight to the beheading year three. Matthew, Mark, Luke go all the way to year three of Jesus' ministry, but John says, I got to start in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was made flesh and it dwelt among us and then he walks through years one years two and years three however John says even though I'm going to do my gospel different he said I'm still going to mention the death burial and resurrection of Jesus just like Matthew Mark and Luke and I'm still going to mention three different baptisms all four gospels mention all three the first baptism the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the to Christ Jesus. So the Holy Spirit possessive grammatically. He owns this baptism. John 16, 8 says that he will convict the world of sin. The Spirit convicts you that you need Jesus. By one Spirit, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, we are baptized into the body. So how many of you remember the time you got saved? Some of you don't. You just saved in the womb like me. That's fine. I've been good since I came out. Come on, son. Ain't that right, baby? Ain't that right? Come on. When you got saved, watch. Something told you to go to that altar call. Something told you to pray that prayer. Something in you. Unexplainable, but something pulled you out of your sin. Some of you were still hungover drunk when you gave your life to Jesus because something in you, something in you pulled the Spirit was convincing you, you're sinful, you need to be washed in the blood. And when you came to the altar and said yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit took the bucket of Jesus' blood that speaks a better word and pours it over your life. For what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So the Holy Spirit pours the blood over you and now pulls you into sonship through its redemptive qualities. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Then after you do that, you cleanse yourself by showing the world that you love Jesus and you allow a pastor or a disciple or an apostle or a bishop or somebody that believes is your friend to baptize you now in water. That's the second baptism. When you got baptized in water, that was your second baptism, according to Scripture. Matthew 28, 19, make disciples of all the nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But then Jesus has a baptism that belongs to him. It's the baptism of Jesus into the Spirit. Very different than salvation. Matthew 3.11. Your Bible says that Jesus will do what? And with fire. Will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now I'm going to show you even more of these three baptisms. How many of you want a little more? <coughs> so Jesus has a baptism. Holy Spirit has a baptism. Disciples have a baptism. Now, there are three, the Bible says, three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Logos, and the Holy Spirit. Now, when heaven meets the earth, comes down, watch what the Bible says the transition is the baptisms in complete reverse. And there are three that bear witness on the earth. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. It is the blood first. 
then the water, and then the spirit. It is the outer court blood, the brazen, the brazen altar, the inner court, the brazen lever, the word. It is the holy place. You've got the oil, and then the holy of holies, which is the glory of God. You don't get to go to the blood and then go to the water and bypass the oil to get in the holy of holies. What happens if you go to the holy of holies, Kenneth, if you bypass one of the stations? You die. I say, you say I'm going to die if I don't speak in tongues? No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you would never dare bypass one of the places to get to the glory of God. Why would we take the baptism of the spirit into the body, take the baptism of a disciple in the water, and then try to bypass the oil and get to the fullness of God? Three baptisms. Salvation baptism is sonship. Water baptism is new life. Spirit baptism is power to walk in that new life. Now watch. Go ahead. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I got so much teaching. I, we're just going to, we're just going to, we got to run with this. We got to run with it. We got to run. Jesus in John 20 shows up to these disciples, says, I only do what Father does, whew, breathes on them the breath of God, the Spirit of God, because the Spirit of God did nothing but descend and ascend and descend and ascend all throughout the Old Testament. Do you know the first time that the Spirit of God, since the Garden of Eden, got to the earth and stayed? At the Jordan River. When there was a certain man that walked down the muddy riverbanks of the Jordan that got baptized, the Bible says that the Spirit of God then descended upon him like a dove. Then the Holy Spirit stayed on the earth, but nobody else could carry it because nobody else had been washed in the blood yet. That's why Jesus couldn't breathe on his disciples till after he died. After he died, the spirit then began to wash in the blood. So Jesus came and said, I got to give you what just washed you in the blood, which is the spirit. So whew, here's the Holy Spirit. It is now in you. Then Jesus said, now you got the Holy Spirit in you, but it's still not enough. I want you to go away. Tell me this. If there was nothing after salvation, why did they have to go wait and they couldn't go share their faith right away? If nothing else exists, if baptis, I mean, baptism in water is the only, is the end of it, why did Jesus say wait? So, Pastor, you're passionate about it because I'm tired of pulpits lying to people and keeping them from the fullness of God. <laughs> pulpits of preachers that are unwilling to study and, 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 and connect their self to the fullness of God. Why was there to wait? Because there was something that was coming that was going to empower them to carry out the fullness of their assignment. Can I tell you that, that, that you are not called to get saved and sit. You get saved to act. Lord, you're going to make me work this service. You don't get saved and get to keep your mouth closed about righteousness. You don't get to get saved and keep your mouth closed about the things of the Bible because you're afraid that somebody won't like it and somebody might cancel you and somebody might get upset with you and somebody may say you're judging. The Bible says you're not supposed to judge. Where does your Bible say that at? You can call sin a sin and that's not judging. Judge not lest you be judged. So with whatever measure, you, let me preach this thing, whatever measure you judge, that will be given back to you. But if I look at an apple tree and call it an apple tree because of the fruit that it bears that is not judgment that's just telling the plain old truth we are saved to move things to turn things upside down not to come to church on Sunday pastor saying it yeah I'm saying you didn't get saved to come to church on Sunday you got saved to leave from the church and be the church on Sunday. But Jesus said, look, you shall be my witness, but you can't go yet. So you've got to understand the Bible. Witness don't just mean share your faith in the Greek. It's where we get our English word martyr. Sharing your faith is not just telling somebody about Jesus and it costing you nothing. Jesus said, you need to go wait for the baptism in the Holy Spirit because I got to know that you got enough power that when you're looking, 
that X-shaped cross, Andrew, when you're looking at it, when you're, when you're looking at being bored alive, when they say they won't like you anymore and they say they're going to cancel you and they don't like what you post and stand for righteousness and make everything you say a political thing and you've got to stand in the face of the enemy, you've got to ask yourself, will you still stand when they got a gun to your head and tell you they're going to kill you and kill your family? Will you still? You say, Pastor, that sounds extreme. I'm telling you, there's coming a day where folks will have to get, people are giving their life now. You t- we just in our American westernized bubble, but there are people all over the world saying yes to Jesus. They are being martyred for their faith. You need the Holy Spirit to be martyred. That kind of strength. And the Holy Spirit is what gives you the power to walk a supernatural life of heaven on earth. Number three, number three, number three. Why did God choose tongues as an evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit? Why? Great question. It's okay, you can say that. Say, Pastor, that's a great question. I would like to know. If you don't want to know, you go hear it anyways. The first, watch, the initial evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit in Scripture was speaking in tongues. The first thing that happened chronologically in Scripture, okay, was speaking in tongues. It is not the only evidence of being baptized with or in the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 13.1 says it is, before I forget this, thank you Holy Spirit again, because this is not in my notes. If anybody ever told you if you don't speak in tongues that you ain't going to heaven, they lied to you. There is no condemnation and no shame in this service. You do not have to speak in tongues to go to heaven. Tell that to the thief on the cross. Absolutely do not. But I'll tell you this, if you want to live the fullness of God on this earth, it will sure enough help you to be able to pray according to the will of God. Now, how many of you believe, 1 Corinthians 13 calls it the language of angels. How many of you believe that Jesus removes the curse of sin in every single way? Raise your hand. Now, everybody, raise your hand. Do you believe Jesus removes every curse? Okay. Every curse. Languages were never mentioned in the Bible until sin confused them. Did you know that? The languages were never mentioned until sin, pride came in and forced God to have to confuse or curse the language. Genesis chapter 11, Tower of Babel. The Bible said that the whole world had and one common speech. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. And the Lord said something that that was puzzling. If as one people speak in the same language, they began to do this, then nothing they do will be impossible for them. Hold on a minute. Hold on. Hold on. If you read the Bible, if everybody in here spoke English, which is a language that if you can figure it out, you're real smart because it don't even make sense hardly, especially when I speak it. Everybody speaking English, could we build a tower all the way to the throne room of God? How about Spanish? Jesus es vivo. Come on. I speak all kind of languages up in here. No. So obviously God is not talking about a language that is native to the earth. Because if they have a language that empowers them to build something to heaven, and God is so threatened that this pride will get in the way, God comes out of heaven with with the Son and with the Holy Spirit because the same way he said, let us make man in our image, he said, let us now go and confuse the language that they are speaking. So then there was a dispersing of people and the language was cursed and confused so that they would not understand each other. Now, you said you believe that Jesus restores the curse of every sin. So then surely Jesus came to restore the curse of all of us having different languages. Surely. 
Well, in your Bible, there are Messianic prophecies, but in Zephaniah, there happens to be a Holy Spirit prophecy. And the Bible says it like this, For then I will restore to the people a pure language that they all may call on the name of the Lord to serve him. Take it out of your pocket with what? With one accord. That's Acts chapter 2. That is the full work of the cross of Jesus Christ. When he came to restore to the people a pure language. So that once again, Acts chapter 2 didn't miss anything. So that suddenly, while they were in one accord, a language from heaven fell down. That was the fulfillment that Jesus had done. Everything that he promised he would do. Oh, I thank God today to be able to pray the language of heaven and walk in the fullness of Jesus. This is the completed work of Christ removing the curse of the mouth. That your Bible says in James that no man can tame the tongue. You said next to somebody that can't tame the tongue. Somebody got that and said amen. You ever known somebody who couldn't tame the tongue? You ever been married to somebody who couldn't tame the tongue? Uh-huh. Let me tell you my story. That's why I come on this side over here to tell it. You see, there was this one time, Kenneth, that me and the first lady, about once a year we get in heated fellowship. That's about it because I'm such a good husband to her. I'm playing. If you're a guest here, they say, well, the arrogance of that preacher. I'm playing. But about once a year we get in this heated fellowship. And there's something about praying in the Holy Ghost. It fixes everything. And I don't remember if it was me or if it was you. Oh, it was me being the good one. Okay, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. It was me. It was you. Okay. It was this one time when we was in heated fellowship, and we was just mouthing off at each other because in our house, it's like somebody, when you get, when your marriage is in a bad place, somebody's got to win, right? If, you, if you're in a marriage and somebody always has to win, it's in a bad place because that will suggest you're on different teams. We're on the same team. But every now and then, about once a year, we act like we're on different teams. And, I, and I'm like, and when, and, when, and when I get ready to go, believe it or not, I'm the more talkative one. I know, yeah. And I start, I start using preacher skills sometimes. Talk to your neighbor. If you read your Bible. Woman, submit to your man. Fellas, let me tell you, that don't ever work. Does not work. You can go to Ephesians all day long. You can get a, a slap upside the face is what you're going to get. And in our heated fellowship, all of a sudden, she starts, she starts, came in on a Honda, left on a Yamaha, tie my bow tie, untie my bow tie, praying in the Holy Ghost. She is praying and spitting fire out of her mouth. I mean, we in the middle of an argument, and she all of a sudden just said, Karababa, And, and all of a sudden, it's like this, you get delivered, and you're like, fine, I'll just pray with you. <laughs> and everything gets better. And then you pray together, and then two become one, and it's a beautiful thing. Praise God. Come on, somebody give the Lord praise. Somebody give the Lord praise. It tames the tongue. Now, number four, what does the Holy Spirit say when he prays through me? Praying in the Holy Spirit does not make us super spiritual. It makes us super you. So if you pray in the Holy Spirit, you are not a better Christian. You pray in tongues, you are not a better Christian. Romans 8, 26, Paul says it like this, that the Spirit helps in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with what? Groanings, which are too deep for words, according to the will of God. If you're going to do anything great in the kingdom, there are going to be moments in life when you don't know what to do. I said, if you ever do anything for God, there are going to be moments, Erica, that you get your back against the wall and you don't know what to do. The storm is going to rise up. You're going to have to be in a moment where you feel like Jesus is sleeping. That there, there are going to be giants that come against you. There are going to be moments that you say, Lord, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know what I'm supposed to pray. Has anybody ever been inside of a moment that you didn't even have the English words to put on your desperation? You were so desperate for God to show up that you didn't know the right thing to say, but you 
fell down on your face and you started you started praying in the Holy Ghost because it was too deep for your words to get on so the spirit of God came and started to pray through you and 1 Corinthians 14 said that you, when you speak in tongues you are personally strengthened now groanings is a Greek word his stemi, which means to strengthen a family and to keep a kingdom intact you start praying in the Holy Ghost, your kids will get stronger. Your marriage will get stronger. The kingdom of God, this church will get stronger. If we'll stop fighting what Jesus wants to do and just receive all of him, do you know what we can do in this city with an entire church baptized in fire? Jude one twenty. but you, beloved, build yourself up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. This is why in my tough seasons I don't have to make dumb decisions. Because when hell breaks loose and I don't know what to do and I need direction for my family, my business, my church, I pray in the Holy Ghost so that my earthly weakness can get replaced with heaven's power. And here's the good news. Pastor Troy Luke 137 says that everything I pray in the Spirit will come to pass because no word from God ever fails. No word from God. Now, worship team, if y'all get ready, go ahead and, and, and hop on over here. But I want to get ready to ease us back into worship for just a moment. I need you to get here quick with me, though. I don't have time to pump and prime this morning and beg you. I need you to jump in quick with me. Number five, is the baptism of Jesus in the Holy Ghost, is it for today? Is it for today? The baptism of Jesus in the Holy Ghost, is it for today? There is a great religious spirit that fights two T's in the church so strong. You know them. Tithe and tongue. That's why some folk don't tithe, because they like their money. No, we're going to tell the truth and shame the devil. It's why folks don't want tongues, because we like our comfort. We like our money, and we like our comfort. And so anytime somebody preaches on the tithe and the tongues, somebody's like, I don't believe that. That's not of God. That's Old Testament. Don't even read your Bible. How do you know? you just greedy. No, I don't, I, no, I, uh-uh, yeah. I don't, I don't want all that tongue stuff. It's, it's Christmas morning. There are ten gifts for you. You have nine of them. It's a real good Christmas morning, but why you want to leave one under the tree? God's got another one for you. God's got something fresh for you. So Acts promises that when the Holy Spirit comes, it'll be for your children and for all those who are far off in Acts 2.39. All those who are far off means generations to come. Tongues has not ceased. Somebody has lied to you. It is continuing to flow, but it has to be decent and it has to be in order. You say, what is order? I'm saying if there is corporate tongues and it is out loud in a moment, there must be an interpretation. But there is a tongues of praying and a tongues of worshiping that's for edification of you and for the strengthening of you. That you can pray in the spirit and you can worship in the spirit and it will build you up. You want to know why the devil hates your worship and your prayer in tongues? Because 1 Corinthians 14 2, he doesn't understand it. He doesn't know what it is that you're praying. He doesn't know the mysteries that you're uttering. So my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy. But verse 39, come on with me in the back. You got the flow with me. 1 Corinthians 14. 14, the next one. Next one. Next one. And do not forbid speaking in tongues. Don't allow your fleshly bias or fear of the enemy keep you from a promise that was meant for you. Praying in the Holy Spirit is your right now connection to heaven on earth. It's your right now connection. You ain't in heaven right now. You own the earth. But you need something to tap into something from another world. It would, it would be like this. If I, I've used this example before, but it's so powerful and illustrated for you to see. If I had somebody in here, I'd bring them up on stage from uh, uh, um, um, Brazil. Speak Portuguese. I'm telling you, I'm getting better. Puerto Rico. Speak Espanol. Haiti. Speak Creole. Right? And I had them up here, and each in their tongue, 
If Marcy, if you come up here right now and, and, and you read John 3.16 in Creole, most people wouldn't understand it. Right? She would sit here and read it and you wouldn't get it. Some of you, if I read it in Spanish, very few of you would not get it, but some of you would not get it. Portuguese, same thing. You wouldn't get it. Just because you don't understand it, does it make what they said any less real? Does it make it any less truthful? Just because you didn't get it yet, because you haven't studied the language enough, you haven't experienced enough, you haven't been exposed to it enough, does it make the gospel any less real because you don't understand the package that it came in? But watch. It gets better. This is why, this is why I love praying in the Holy Ghost. They're in America. So when you talk to me, you speak English. You speak English. We talk, we speak English. We are in America. But if you are from Haiti, are from Brazil, are from Puerto Rico, that's your home. You're just in America. So while you're here, yes, you speak English. But what would happen, Marcy, if you was to call back home? You would speak Creole. You would speak Spanish. You would speak Portuguese. Why? Because that's your native tongue. That's the tongue where you would call back home. Every time you want to call back home, you speak the language of where you came from. Mauricio, I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. So when I said, I'm calling back home. I'm calling back to daddy. Lord, show up for my children. Show up for this generation. Show up for this church. Show up for this city. Somebody lift your hands and cry out. So fill me up, God. Fill me up, God. Fill me up, Come on, lift God. your hands. Lift fill your voices. Cry out right now. Fill me cry out up, in English. God. Fill me Come on, pray it. God. Pray it. Now shout it with desperation, with desperation, as loud as you can, shout it. stage there's nothing up here on this screen for you Listen, 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 listen. The enemy doesn't know what your what is about to happen. The enemy is resisting this, resisting this, because he knows he doesn't understand what you're about to pray. 
I would go even a step further and tell you, do you know where Satan is, was from originally? Yeah. He was an angel. I propose to you that it could quite possibly be, be that Satan hates you speaking the language of heaven so much because you speak in the language he lost and can never get back. So I'm about to invite you to this altar, to the way. You don't even have to get down here if you can't. God can feel you right where you are. But you're about to pray in tongues for the first time. You're about to receive your heavenly prayer language in this room. You would not have believed, first service, just scores of people in the altar praying in the Holy Spirit. First time. 13-year-olds up here praying in the Holy Ghost. So the question remains is will the Holy Spirit, just a little bit, just a little bit, will the Holy Spirit force your mouth open? Some people think that in order to pray in tongues, it's, it has to be the Holy Spirit just moves your mouth. Will the Holy Spirit take over your mouth? Psalms 81.10, the Bible says that I am the Lord your God. Open, you open your mouth wide, I'll fill it. God is not obligated to partner with anything outside of faith. So you have to open your mouth in faith. What does that mean? It means it's going to feel silly. The devil's going to tell you, oh, that's not really God. You're just gibbering. You're just jibber-jabbering. That's what the enemy will tell you. Oh, this is not for everybody. Even right now, the enemy's trying to stop some of you. Every mute spirit that has kept your mouth closed... From experiencing the fullness of God, I command you by the authority of Christ, the blood of Jesus, to leave this room. But then watch it, Acts chapter 2, when it happened. The Bible said that they began to speak. George, they began to speak. They began to speak. God didn't take their jaw and move it. They began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit then gives them the utterance. In other words, they opened their mouth and the Spirit began to give them the utterance of the things to say. And so as you open your mouth today, the Spirit will give you utterance. You don't think English. You don't try to say English until all of a sudden it just turns into it. Every, and there's no expectation on the sound. There's no expectation on what yours is like and what your neighbor's is like. Everybody's is different. This is your private this is not your corporate language. This is your private prayer language. Back to heaven. Is there anybody in this room today that for the first time you say, Pastor, I want it. Raise your hand. You say, I want it across this room. Raise your hand high. All over this room. You say, I, I want this. How many of you are saying in this room that you need a fresh feel? You need to be filled fresh. Raise your hands high. You need to be filled fresh. Fresh. It's been a long time since you've done it. You don't practice it. If for the first time you want to receive it, you say, Pastor, I've never had my prayer language. Run to this altar now. Run to this altar. We're going to pray with you. Run to this altar. I'm telling you, there's faith in the room for it. There's faith in the room for it. Don't you dare. Let your pride keep you. Don't you let religion keep you. If God has something for you, you, you better run down to this altar and say, God, I want it. Come on. Come on. Look at the young people coming from all over hungry. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. This city is about to get stronger. The kingdom of God is about to turn some things upside down. Come on. Thank you. Now what? If you want to get filled fresh, I don't have room for you at the altar. Just step in the aisleway. Step in the aisleway. Fresh touch of God. If you can't get in the aisleway, just lift your hands. Here's what's about to happen. One more time, Pastor Jamil. We're going to sing this song. Listen to me at the altar. Look at me. I'm giving instruction right now. I need you to look. Lift your hands and say, God, fill me up. I'm going to pray in the middle of that song. And cry out for Jesus to do what he promised to do. To baptize us with fire. And he said these signs will follow. 
and you open your mouth at that point, no more singing, fill me up. Open your mouth and just begin to pray. People say, well, Pastor, you do it on command. Yes, because that's my prayer language. I speak normal like this, and you've got the faith for me to speak this. Why not have the faith for me to speak bilingual, a natural and a spiritual language? It's not that far out. My, my, my pastor, Apostle Rayleigh, always says it like this. He says, you already believe that you get washed in the blood. It forgives you of your sins. You're already weird. You already believe that a man raised from the dead sits on a throne and prays for you. You're already way out there. You also believe that one day you're going to die and you're going to get resurrected and go to heaven. Your belief system is already way out there. Why not go ahead and receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost and begin to pray in your heavenly prayer language? So right now, fill me up, God. Come on, fill me up. Cry out. Cry out right now. Cry out. Real desperate. Real desperate. God, feel me up. Feel me up. Come on, get desperate. Feel Cry out. Me up, Cry out. God, feel me up. Okay, God, one more time. One more time. Up, fill me up. Feel me up. God, feel me up. Here we go. God, Are you ready? Up, Jesus, God, do what you promised. Baptized in fire. Everybody pray in spirit. Pray in spirit. Pray in spirit. Worship team in the microphone. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Look at this. Look. Thank you, Jesus. That's it, son. Louder, louder. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Come on, Holy Ghost Church. Pray. Pray. Go pray, pray. That's it, Abby. That's it. Pray, pray. It's not silly. It's not weird. You open your mouth and start speaking. So rebebe sarababa santai. Se karababa sorobobobo sete. Grab that microphone and pray, son. Ababa kosa mika. Ababa kosa mika. I can't live in a bed. Ababa kosa mika. Ababa so. Come on, we got a nine-year-old up here praying in the Holy Ghost. Nine years old, my son just got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Open your mouth. Okay, watch. That's it. Marababa corre bebe satai. Seca rababa so corre bebe satai. Morre be antama so corre bebe satai. Once again, this is Jude. This is not corporate tongues that needs interpretation. This is our heavenly prayer language to strengthen and edify ourselves. Just open your mouth, let him feel it. 
Rabashi Karababa Soko Rebebe Sandaria Tababasi So Rebebe Sarababa Korebe Karabasote Ishiriande Rebe Korababasai Wurramasoria Tabaji The song, the song, the song Karababasi Watch, how many, of you, how many of you down here got it for the first time? Raise your hands you, for the first time. Right here. First time. Come on, Abby. First time. Anybody else down here? First time, young man. How old are you? 18 years old. Come on. First time. Raise your hand. Go ahead. I want this to stir your faith, church. That God is showing up by signs and wonders as a sign to the unbeliever. Your Bible says that tongues is a sign to the unbeliever. Now watch. Listen, listen. Now, here's the deal. Pastor John, come on up here. If you want to stay next service for a little extended time at the altar, you can. If, if you feel like you got what God calls you to get today, please. No, I'm just in, inviting people that want a little more. If you're, if you're headed out, go ahead and run, run to your car when we get done here. Go ahead and go to your car, get you a little um, matcha tea, vanilla oat milk latte, and get onto your car. Um, but if you need to stay, stay in this altar, okay? Now listen. Couple things. No shame, no condemnation. Some of you feel like you left here today and you didn't get anything. The devil's a liar. You did. Pastor Troy was parked in his driveway with the emergency brake on when he was younger and spent so much time and never got it, never got it, never got it. And the enemy was condemning him and shaming him. And guess what happened? He got filled in the driveway right there in that moment. My mother-in-law, it happened to her in her room. No preacher. My wife had happened into service that, that, that it wasn't even about the Holy Spirit. She was laying in the back. I'm saying that it could happen to you at any moment. The key is you continue to pursue it. You don't stop pursuing it. And today, if you spoke in tongues, the key is I want you to continue to do so. When you started speaking English, you had to learn how to speak it and continue to speak it, right? You did. You did. Same thing with speaking in tongues. It is your heavenly language now. You have to continue to talk. So, so tomorrow, pray in the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen? Amen?